Welcome, welcome. All right, so we're going to make this pretty conversational. Um, as was shared, my name's Yancey. I'm the Director of Sustainability at Davidson College, where I am absolutely privileged uh, to be able to think about campus projects related to our environmental and social impact, as well as spending a lot of time with young people on our campus and partners, uh, like some of those in this room in our community. And um, on a personal note, I'm the mother to two boys, and um, so think about sort of their lives and futures as well, and do a lot of work in the community around um, youth engagement and education on these issues, as well as intergenerational connections. And so it's great to see so much of that intergenerational learning today. And if anybody was depressed, you know, hearing some of the news and information you were hearing today, or you ever get that way when you're scrolling your environmental feeds or whatever, um, here's your antidote right here. You're in the right place for that. Um, so with that, we'll start with some introductions. I want to start to my left. We have Shruti Agrawal, who's a junior. She just came from class, y'all. She left math class to come be with us today um, from Audrey Kell High School. So Audrey, I mean, Shruti, sorry. Why don't you take us away, and then we'll do introductions as we get down the road. <clears throat> well, hi, everyone. Um, as Yancy said, I'm Shruti Agrawal, and I'm so grateful to be here. I hope to share my experiences about this organization I founded called New Normal X, and it started as a science fair project in 2019 to try and get um, middle and high schoolers engaged in climate crisis and just kind of how they can help. So the main idea was that they would do challenges that took less than five minutes a day, and they would get volunteer hours for it. So those challenges were really simple. They were just taking shorter showers or using reusable straws, but I really saw that people were passionate about helping the environment, but they just didn't know where to start. So that's kind of the mission of New Normal, to get people involved if they don't know where to start. Um, I got involved with Cleaner NC a few years ago with their Blue Sky Awards, and I've been working with them ever since. My personal goal includes um, going to like healthcare sustainability sides, but I'm not really sure where I want to go to college yet. But as for New Normal, I definitely want to... <laughs> As for New Normal X, I really want to continue throughout college and beyond, and let's see where I go. <laughs> Thanks, and welcome, Shruti. Next, we have Bailey Scarlett, who I'm lucky to work with um, as a sophomore at Davidson College. Hello, uh, my name is Bailey Scarlett, and I am from Raleigh, North Carolina, but currently I am a student, I'm a sophomore at Davidson College. Uh, my major is environmental studies, and I'm minoring in, minoring in English. Um, and the environmental studies department is a key detail about that because they have been a huge part of my journey into the world of environmental justice. Um, and the special thing about that department is how much it focuses on interdisciplinarity. Um, I am, at my core, a STEM student. Um, I'm getting a Bachelor of Science, but that department lets me take classes in the environmental humanities, the environmental social sciences. I get to learn about environmental justice and art and the personal narratives of people who have lived through um, experiences very different than mine, all as a part of that core curriculum um, with really awesome professors who can guide me through that. Um, and similar, similarly, that department led me to the Sustainability Scholars Program, which is how I first got in contact with Clean Air and Sea. Um, that program matches students to summer-long internships in the sustainability or climate justice space, and I was matched with Clean Air. I spent the summer in the office working with all sorts of people and all sorts of projects. Um, I spent most of my time, though, in the Community Science Department where I spent time with the network of air monitors distributed all around the state to help fill in the gaps in regulatory monitoring done by the government. Um, and that was, that was a big turning point for me because I got to look at that data and figure out how to make it usable and who, who needs to see it and how do they need to see it. And then I got to work with it to make it um, presentable in a format that would be understandable. And I'm also a stakeholder in a new project um, from Clean Air, very similar in the same vein about data accessibility with a dashboard, um, because all of the people who graciously host air monitors um, on their property deserve to see the data they produce. And um, I am a stakeholder and contributing um, in the long term to that project as well. 
Um, and in the future, I will be studying sustainable development in Northern Europe through a program in Copenhagen, Denmark. Um, and I'll take classes in urban livability and food security there. Um, but outside of class, I am a trip leader and a mountain guide with Davidson's Outdoors program, which focuses on making um, outdoor experiences and trips accessible to all the students, um, where I hold certifications in first aid and trip management and leadership. Um, that is all I've got. Great. Thank you, Bailey. Mm -hmm. And last, but certainly, certainly not least, we have Harmony Mason, who's a senior, right, at Catawba College. Welcome, Harmony. Thank you. Hi, I'm Harmony Mason. Um, I'm very excited to be here to talk to you guys today, and I hope I get to share some experience, um, my experience with you guys. Um, I'd like to start by saying that I'm also from Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, currently, I am a senior, and I will be graduating in May. I go to Catawba College. And I am the oldest of five other siblings, and they're all probably watching me right now <laughs> on the live stream. Uh, hey, guys. <laughs> but um, yeah, so my major is environment and sustainability, and I have a minor in information systems. I started with uh, geographic information systems, but I wanted to go more of a broader route and just technology in general. Um, so I went for just information systems as my minor. Um, after I graduate, I know that I will be going to London for a couple of months and hopefully we're, uh, working a remote job, most likely, and um, when I come back, I do want to stay in the Charlotte area, but I am open to other experiences, and I really want to focus my um, future education on waste management and residential segregation and, you know, agriculture industries and environmental injustices and how to advocate for better policies and rights for people that may not have the same voice I have currently. Um, and I also just hope that I could encourage other youth to speak up and feel, I guess, more empowered to do more and take action regardless of their education level, um, their experience. Um, but yeah, so thank you. <laughs> All right. I hope you were taking note that Harmony is ready to work in the Charlotte area in a few months, people. Um, <clears throat> all right, so we're going to try a conversational approach on this, and we'll see if it, if it works with folks just sort of jumping in as they feel, you know, called to answer a certain question. Um, first, let's start with where you started. Who or what has inspired you to become a climate justice leader? I can start. Um, for me, there are, there's a lot of major milestones in that process, but it was less of a flashbulb moment and more of a slow journey and um, almost a crawl in some, sometimes. Uh, that is certainly not finished and might change directions, almost certainly will um, make twists and turns. Uh, but one that I'd like to point out was a conversation I had with a friend um, about a year ago. Um, during, during a transitional period in my life where they, they were describing to me um, the concept of ikigai from Japanese philosophy, which is commonly summarized as like your reason for being, and it consists of um, a balance of four things, like what you are good at doing, what you love to do, what you can get paid for doing, and what the world needs you to do. Um, and that was the first time I had heard of a specific word to summarize that feeling. But um, as that part of my life being involved in climate justice um, slowly moved forward and kept progressing, I realized that that definition fit well. Um, and it's not something that you, you notice consciously because we, I think, it's pretty fair to say that when we as humans are good at something or like something, we stick with it. Um, and so it kind of just stuck. Um, and I, I noticed over a long period of time, maybe not long period of time for y'all's perspective, but um, from my perspective, it seemed like a while. And, um, and yeah, it, it was kind of a, a retrospective realization. 
Great. Yeah, those, I think those guiding sort of frameworks can be so helpful and work that can be so um, disparate and complicated and, and hard to know where to focus. Were you going to share, Harmony? Yeah, um, so mine was kind of the same, same start. It was pretty slow. I knew I always liked being outside. I loved nature. I, you know, was, I had a, a little brother growing up, so we were always just playing outside, getting dirty. And I think when I was planning to go to college, I had no idea what I wanted to do. I remember being younger and like, oh, I want to be an interior designer. And that's not really what I wanted to do. It was just something fun that I watched on TV, at uh, HGTV or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I realized soon that I had this calling and love for nature and the connection that I felt like I was missing that I was supposed to have between you know myself and the land. And so I just remember kind of finding something in a class that I took in high school, it was in my first environmental science class where I really learned about climate change and environmental issues and I kind of got into those debates with people on whether climate change was real or not and I think that's where it kind of sparked an interest in me because I definitely believed in climate change and I wanted to see what I could do as a young person to figure out how to combat the issues that were you know, accompanying um, climate change. And so once I got to college, I decided to just go, in, go straight into the environmental science major, um, well, environment and sustainability major with a concentration in environmental science. Um, and I just remember thinking that, you know, I have no idea, you know, what is behind climate change, that I've learned things about like my ecological footprint and carbon emissions and all of that stuff. As a freshman, I'm freshly 18. Um, and so it just led me down this very long path of figuring out the rest of the issues that are going on in this world and just wanting to do something about it. And so as years go on, I started doing my own research. I did um, mercury uh, bioaccumulation and um, just testing for uh, mercury in the fish uh, that were on our ecological preserve on campus. And I had found that we had methylmercury in our fish um, just because uh, previously we had, I think it was an agriculture uh, field or something that had been there like many, many years ago. I could be wrong, but that's just what I was told. Um, but either way, there are traces of you know microplastics, methylmercury in different things that we eat and that we consume and in our bodies ourselves. And that was just one of the first of many research projects that I did and eventually it just led to me wanting to pursue research after college and um, yeah so I definitely think research is what started it for me but it originally started when I was a kid in this connection that I had with nature. Thanks for sharing that story. Um, those are always hard moments when you come to realize like how close to home some of these issues hit. Yeah. Um, but glad that you're leveraging them for good. So, did you want to share on this question, Shruti? Um, yeah, so this is going to sound really random, but when I was looking for a science for a project, um, I'd recently watched the Disney movie Frozen, and um, I really loved the Do You Want to Build a Snowman song, so I'd always ask my older sister if she wanted to build a snowman. But throughout the years, I realized that there was less snow in Charlotte, so I realized that something must be done. And then combine that with my first Fitbit in eighth grade, um, I was super motivated to walk, and I researched on like how they actually motivate people, and it's really simple, just giving online incentives that virtually mean nothing. It can really motivate a person. So I figured that would be a great way to inspire people around me and I guess that's kind of how I started using the concept of gamification and watching Frozen. So little eighth grade me had ambitious <laughs> hopes to bring back the snow in Charlotte. Um, but yeah, that's kind of just how I started and I've been going since there. I think that it sounds like there's either some Frozen fans or some Fitbit fans in the audience. <laughs> uh, that's a great story. So one thing we talked about as we were preparing for this conversation is how, you know, we're currently in education, either working or learning as students. Um, and so we clearly value that practice of learning. Um, and yet we also, on these issues, we feel very passionate about the need for action and change. 
And so I'd like to hear from the panelists about how you balance those trade-offs between taking the time to learn about a topic or a community or, um, or you know, something that will inform your work versus jumping in to just do something about it. I'll, I'll, okay, I'll go first. <laughs> Um, so one way that I balance, um, you know, my education and taking action and everything else that comes with a climate activist leader that I'm currently trying to pursue and become more and more of every day, um, I would say the first thing that you really need to focus on is educating yourself. And it doesn't mean you have to be an expert in what you're learning about and what you're doing research on. Um, I think it's it's best that you don't know everything, but to have some basic understanding of the issues that are going on and the issues that you want to get involved in and to try to advocate for, I think it's best that you understand a little bit of what's going on and then learn as you go. Because I think making mistakes and you know just kind of like pushing yourself into taking action on an issue is the best way to learn and grow in this um, leadership field and to how to gain more skills. Um, and I also think that networking is very, very important, something that I've realized um, very recently. Uh, that is exactly how I ended up here, actually. <laughs> so last year, I was asked to do an introduction speech for Richard Moore. I don't know if you guys remember him from last year's Breathe Conference. Uh, I was at the town hall, and I did the introduction speech for him, and I just you know, started working my networking and um, ended up doing an internship for him for almost a month in New Mexico. And I uh, worked with him and he was my mentor and he taught me so many things, especially networking and how to involve yourself in the community and how to use the people that you meet and to let them use you, you know, to make opportunities and to also not be afraid to take those opportunities. Um, so, that, and I think that this whole process has led to me learning how to balance um, taking action and learning and just everything else involved. <laughs> Thank you, Harmony. Do you want me to? Sure, go ahead. Um, so, one of the biggest things that of my generation is obsessed with is social media. And I feel like it's the best way to get information across so there's often a disconnect between what's really going on and what people post, like fake news and stuff. So whenever I come across like a new story or just want to educate myself about a current environmental topic, I usually spend like a few hours just thinking about both sides and what the true story really is. And after that, I always try to find social media posts that are as accurate as they can be without like having any kind of bias. And just reposting it or like sharing it with my friends that really gets the word out and they're able to connect it. Um, one of the biggest things in our English class is trying to connect outside events into our essays. So it, like believe it or not, but a few times we've had a prompt that's about environmental studies or just related to something about that topic and they're able to use those events that are currently going on into our essays. So it not only helps with educating ourselves outside of school, but it helps in school and people are just more incentivized to learn about environmental topics without feeling overwhelmed or helpless, helpless like seeing all the potential catastrophes that could happen. Just seeing each other work together is really inspirational for all of us. Yeah, I agree. And the tricky thing about being students is we are by definition considered to not know as much um, and that doesn't, it doesn't bode well for feeling like you have the authority or the necessary resources to consider action. Um, but one way I like to reframe it is instead of learning and doing is more of like listening and speaking. Um, kind of like the, the saying, you have two ears but one mouth, so you listen twice as much as you speak. Um, that seems like a good framework for such an experience-centered field as climate justice, um, because like at the very center of all the work that gets done is the real experiences of the people who are there 
um, and who are seeing and feeling and hearing the problems. Um, and sometimes the action is just listening. Like that is the doing. Just by being in a room or participating, like you don't have to be the, the top of the pyramid leader. Um, just, just by being there in the room, you are simultaneously learning and doing, um, which is something that's been really comforting from the perspective of someone who feels like they're constantly surrounded by people more accomplished than me, um, i.e. this room. And, and so just by being in a space, I feel like I'm like making my baby step forward. Great, thank you, more than a baby step. So I know that I have learned some new strategies or been reminded about strategies to be effective in my work from what they've just shared. Anybody else had that experience? based on what you've just heard from our young people. Thank you. All right, let's talk a little bit more, you know, certainly to sort of many of the examples and the, the themes that we've been engaging through this conference. Um, how do you all, as young leaders in this space, think that we can create more inclusive and equitable spaces for young people, specifically in the climate movement? <clears throat> Um, so as Bailey said earlier, since we're students, we often don't feel like we have the power, but um, I think school is the best way to start. I get involved with most of the things I do through school, and we have this club at our school called Environmental Club, and there's a regional competition called the Envirothon, and it's basically where you educate yourself with as much environmental knowledge, and that includes like current environmental issues, forestry, soil, and a bunch of other things. And then they'll compete, they might include labs and stuff. But the kids that participate are really passionate about helping the climate crisis, but they don't really know where to start other than participating in this competition. So I feel like just having more leaders come to schools and talk about what they can do really makes them feel like they're part of the solution. And it really inspires people. Just being able to interact with people that are already doing so much inspires us to follow in their footsteps. And definitely starting with schools is the best way to include young people and kind of expand outreach. So to add to that, um, I also think that first and foremost, you have to be committed and open to listening and learning. Um, and collaborating with younger people. I think that's one step to be more inclusive and equitable. Um, and I also think another part of that is definitely diverse representation. Um, a lot of marginalized communities and people of different backgrounds, they do not have the same voice as others might have. And it could be good to seek out and engage with those, um, with the youth and with those people that have different experiences, um, just because everybody has a different perspective to contribute to these issues that are going on. And um, I also think it's important to educate and train the youth um, on climate change and advocacy and leadership skills. Um, and this means including resources um, and making those available for people that don't have them. And the resources can include technology, uh, funding, mentorship. All of these things are things that would be very important for people to have um, in order to feel included. Um, and I also think partnerships are really important um, to engage with others and um, especially between the youth and the government. It's very important to have that connection and collaboration, not only with the government, but just with people who may have a little bit more of an upper hand than you do, um, just to learn from them and to advocate for policies and laws that you know, would make a difference for the issues that you're facing. But overall, learning and listening to other people and just trying to give everyone the same equal opportunities is what I think would help make things um, more inclusive for everyone. What I'd like to add to that is something that is stressed frequently in several of my environmental studies classes that's been really meaningful. Um, and it has to do with the ways we value knowledge production. Um, because 
a lot of a lot of what we think we know comes from the institutions of academia, which are in themselves not very diverse or equally represented um, and frequently have similar problems reflected in the work that they produce. Um, and so in a field that is so experience focused, so grassroots oriented as climate justice, um, I've had the chance to interact with some really wonderful professors who have built entire classes around critically analyzing where we get our perception of value from scientific knowledge and how we compare that to um, written or spoken experiences that we consider to be less scientific but really carry just as much, if not more, meaning relevant to the problem we're trying to solve. Yeah, absolutely. Great reminder um, in this room in particular that we reflect on that. Did you want to jump in? I just wanted to mm -hmm. add one more thing. Um, I also think, to add on to all of what we've all said, um, I also think that one of, the, one of the main things that I want to focus on is taking the research and information that I gather and all of the data that I gather from what I find out, um, especially in the future, I want to find a way to somehow make those large scientific terms somewhat simpler for people who may not understand, you know, all of the crazy jargon that a scientist will be using, I'm sure, but <laughs> I, I just think that to be more equitable and inclusive for everybody to know what's going on in their own backyards and in their communities, I think it's not only necessary, but it's super, super important and fair for everybody to know what is going on and for them to know some people may just need that put in simpler terms or put in you know, their own, just maybe said by people that they trust um, and that they can relate to. There's, there's a lot of different, you know, people that could say it in different ways, but I just think that kind of simpling or making things simpler for people to understand would help a lot. Yeah, I agree. Um, pollution science is incredibly data-driven, mm -hmm. and it's really easy to lose people with um, so many like long papers and studies and millimoles of this and polychlorinated <laughs> biphenyls of that and eventually even if you're producing good science it's not going to give the impact that you want it to in good faith um, because it's not knowledge if no one understands it. It's a fair point. I'm definitely feeling like it's been a minute since I've had to deal with millimoles of anything. Anybody else? <laughs> Thankfully. Um, all right, <clears throat> for this final question f from up here, and then we definitely want some chance for the audience to engage with our, our youth up here. I'm envisioning Harmony's younger siblings at home watching. <clears throat> yeah. So what is a message that um, each of you would like to share with other young people about getting involved in climate justice work? Oh, okay, sure. yeah, I'll, I'll start. <laughs> um, so to all of the youth out there, um, especially to my siblings and just anybody else that is younger in the audience. Um, I just want to say that one thing I have learned is to be patient. I kind of, I'm really hard on myself when I feel like I don't know enough or when I don't understand things the first time or I kind of think, oh, I'm not doing enough. But these things take time, especially when you're young. It's, it's good to take the time to learn and to build the skills that you need to become a leader and to do you know, advocacy things. <laughs> and it's just also extremely important that you put yourself out there too and that you take these risks. And you know, there's gonna be opportunities given to you and it's up to you and what you feel comfortable with to take it or decide not to, or you know, having to choose between opportunities. I think it's, it's just so important to just be patient because you have to do what's best for yourself and you have to also learn, for, uh, learn from failure and that 
means taking these risks and you know picking yourself back up when you don't do as well as you think or when you don't know something. Um, and it's also very important to be vulnerable. I know that sounds a little weird, like you know you don't want to you know let everybody in or you know let just trust anybody, but at the same time, being vulnerable and asking those questions, asking for help, asking people, you know, what does this mean, or how do I do this, or how could I be more like this, or just along the, something along those lines, being vulnerable in that way is extremely important. And the last thing I want to say is that our voices as young people do matter. Um, we have a unique perspective, and we have this energy that I'm not saying that you know people who are not younger don't have, but I think it's a little bit different in our in our way that we express things and how we feel things. And I just think that the way that we perceive things and how we react and how we say things, it makes a difference when we share information or when we are fighting for something. It just makes it makes people look at us differently, not in a bad way, but look at us differently in a way like, okay, you know. Of course, these people have said something about it, but we have the youth now sharing their voices, and that's not typically expected. So that's important, as well as just looking for opportunities and staying involved when you can, and don't be scared to take opportunities that are offered to you, and again, do what's best for you, and you can't do everything, especially not at all at once, but you can't do everything in the world, so just do what you can and what feels right. Strong advice, thank you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. I think what I would say is not even you don't have to have it figured out, but please don't have it all figured <laughs> out. Uh, there's not, it's not a, a recipe for, I don't, I don't want to say success, but recipe for progress or even a career. Um, you need to get comfy with wandering a little bit. Like it's not a, don't force yourself into a rigid mold. Um, you're gonna end up losing a lot of amazing qualities and talents that way. Uh, everyone, like especially in something so interdisciplinary, everyone has their own flavor of sustainability, of climate justice, um, and that is necessary to make it a thriving field. Um, like. For instance, with the Sustainability Scholars Program, a big, a big tenant of it was career development. And so um, the other scholars and I talked to a bunch of people in the industry, um, in all walks of life of the industry. And the one thing that was in, like there was very little in common between all of these people, um, from grassroots organizers to corporate employees, um, scientists, architects, artists, and the thing in common was that they had their own, what they're currently doing was their own unique flavor of sustainability. And it was the result of them wandering, sometimes around the world, but often around the job market, um, figuring out what they wanted to do and building off of it. Um, and usually it was just by finding people they thought were cool and sticking with them. Um, like you have an internship with someone and you love it, so you stay with them. And that turns into just your own, I say flavor, flavor again, of sustainability or justice. Thank you. Um, anybody else ever found somebody you thought was cool and stuck with them? It took me way too long to learn that, but that's a great strategy. <clears throat> well, I like it, Shruti. Um, so I guess the biggest thing is to make time if you don't have it. Of course, there's never a right time and there's never enough time. But, you know, if you want to do something, take the action now. And it doesn't even take long to begin. Just whatever you feel like your strength is, just go with that and connect sustainability into it. I feel like a common misconception is that to go to be sustainable or kind of work in that field, you have to go into environmental science or something of that sort. But sustainability is related to every field, whether it's healthcare, business, or engineering. It's something that relates to every field. And for a big stress in, our, in high schoolers' lives is what major they want to choose for college or where they want to go. And sustainability or environmental science isn't even on their mind. But it's important to realize that it'll be connected to your job no matter what you're doing. 
And I just, like, it's important that we develop a strong foundation now so that when it's time to go to college or time to get a job, it'll hopefully be a lot easier to be able to integrate all the different parts into making our job the best it can be. Great. Round of applause for the panelists. All right. Thank you all. Um, we'd love to have some conversation with the room. So please find a mic or raise your hand and, and someone will bring you a mic if you'd like to, you know, ask a question or, or share a comment with the panel. We have one up here, Jeff. Oh, and then, yep. Well, I, I'm, I'm on mic duty, but I also have a question. So, uh, sorry, Dr. Coster. Um, you know, one of the things that I think it's awesome and we want to continue to make space for um, the U function of this um, conference because I think it's important, number one. And number two, yes, your perspective counts and it is important for us to hear that. With that said, how do we as organizations bridge that intergenerational gap that exists and that tension that exists between whether you're a boomer or a Gen Xer in my case, with millennials and Gen Zers. Um, because I think there's a, a tremendous amount of opportunity in sharing the, the lived experiences of folks that have been here that are a part of the problem that now want to be a part of the solutions. So I want to get your perspectives on how do we bridge those gaps? How do we create the environments and the intentionality around providing space and then how do we create that shared uh, knowledge and appreciation for the perspectives? Great. And I want to just remind you all, as we talked about thinking about, you might have a more general answer to this question, and you might also, it might sort of trigger a response of a specific use case where you saw something successful in, in that vein. Does that make sense? <clears throat> so feel free to take a minute and think, and, and as you are ready to jump in, go for it. I'll go ahead and start by saying that I think the most important way to bridge that gap is to just be open. I think a lot of the times the youth kind of feel like their voices don't matter. That's been a line that I feel like a lot of people have heard, but it's true because a lot of the times we have been shut down and we've been put down because we're younger and you know, we don't have all of the knowledge or we're not as wise as people who may have had several years in their field of work or, um, you know, and, and with experience. And we're, we're just trying to learn. And I think that if you give us a chance, um, it will help make those connections because you'll learn so much about the youth and who you're working with. Um, and they'll learn so much from you. I think there's a lot of learning from both ends. And if we can learn from each other, I think that's the best way to bridge those gaps. And one short example that I have, I don't want to make it too long, um, was just working with Richard Moore. Um, and I think we, we both learned things from each other. And he, you know, asked me questions about how I saw things, what, what were my perspectives, and how can we engage the community. And I learned so many ways that he has engaged with this community. And how he has helped them and you know all of the things that he has done along the ways, along his many years of um, working in you know politics and advocacy and uh, environmental injustice. I've just learned so much from him and that's just, I think that's the best way to you know separate, or not separate, sorry, but to get rid of that distance between the youth and people that are older. Yeah, I'd just like to add on really quickly, but one of the biggest motivations for me is like seeing like an internship or a volunteer position that involves something that I feel like I am good at. So for example, one of my friends, she's a really good artist, and so I'm not very good at drawing at all, and I asked her to make a logo for me, and she was able to create a beautiful logo within just a few days that would have taken me a long time, but just that small contribution it's still towards sustainability and 
As an artist, she would love to do like an environmental and artist uh, and like art connected internship or something like that. So it doesn't have to be advertised as a sustainability program. It can also include all the strengths that people can bring, whether it be like website development or um, social media, like managing the Instagram, just little things like that can really bring people in. But yeah. Yeah, specific invitations are great. They give you the confidence to then invite yourself to things later. Yeah, I think I would add too, in you know, honing my approach to working with college students for a number of years, um, Although we, we as older adults might feel the pressure to like keep up with the latest you know, social media or way to connect or communicate. Um, and, and I definitely lean on Shruti's approach of like asking people who are really good at that latest skill to do that. That is a way to engage them. Um, young people, just as the ones you may have in your, you know, your home life or your family life or community, um, are still respond really, really well. And as I think about our small liberal arts campus and the like relationships that many of them developed with, with faculty or staff over their four years, they respond really well to just personal connection too. So don't feel the need to overdo the um, virtual approach. And I loved also Shruti's point about going into schools. I think just that relationship building, um, don't, don't think you need to move past the tried and true methods of connecting with young people. Good afternoon and thank you for a very helpful session. My name is Francis Coster. I run a program called The Pollution Detectives. I have a booth right out front. I'd invite you to come and see. One in five Americans attends or works at a K through 12 school and a good number more go to the schools that you are tied up with. One of the leading climate change groups of our economy are schools. They are leaking dreadful amounts of climate changing gases that are 1,000 to 5,000 times worse than CO2. And they're not regulated. And the only people who can bring attention to this is you. And I have equipment that I will loan you for free to do that. Thank you. Great, thank you for that resource. If you had to do a public service announcement about one issue that could make an impact, what would it be? Um, I'll go ahead and start and I'll, I'll say health or how climate change affects your health and how it could potentially cause more problems. Um, I did a little research about how the in bus lots at schools there's a lot of emissions from the buses and that triggers asthma, it makes it worse for people and can even cause future complications. Um, and I feel like people obviously care a lot about their health and connecting the dots can really emphasize the fact that we need to take action now. Uh, so I just wanted to kind of agree with you. Um, mine would probably be along the same lines. Um, I watched a documentary uh, recently about just the you know livestock industry and having a pig farm and the families that lived near that farm and near the cesspools and how it affected their health and how it caused them a lot of respiratory issues and cancers. And I think that we should just be more aware of where we're putting our waste and what we're doing with it. And it just needs to change. We need to figure out better ways of managing it. And another thing that I probably would also just you know, put out there is just the connection between land and ourselves. I think we have lost that over all of these years. We just don't have that connection anymore, and I, at least not most of us. And I think we really need to go back to listening to our indigenous ancestors and people who are connected with the land still, and we just need to learn how to give back again. Yeah, I think I would say 
ask the obvious questions. Um, if not, a, just because someone does something doesn't mean they've intentionally thought it through. And so the, the seemingly silly questions like, why is that light on all night? Why do, you why do you drive a truck that big? And all of that, that, can, that, that mindset will lead you down some paths that you really won't expect um, because that means essentially holding authority figures accountable. And so frequently I know that Yancey gets questions oh, about yes. <laughs> things that happen at Davidson. Like, why can't I recycle this type of plastic? Or why is this light on 24 seven? Why doesn't the dining hall compost? All sorts of things like that. And even we if- We do compost, Bailey, we've been over this. <laughs> Just to set the record straight. And even, even if that one question doesn't instantly solve the problem, it puts it on the mind of the people in charge. And it causes them to ask the same question of themselves. And then they have to convince themselves that it's either wrong or it's right. Um, and that's a little harder than just leaving it silently in the status quo. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> and that, um, I would just remind you all too that that carries forward into your communities, asking those same questions you know, in the groups that you're part of as part of what you've already begun to do and I hope you'll continue to do. Um, we have a two minute warning which gives us time for one more question, I think. <laughs> if there's somebody wanting to connect with today's youth No, happy hour is on everyone's mind. Okay, that sounds good. Well, another round of applause for our youth panelists. Thank you all.